I am the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, the mission of the IHC is to advance knowledge about human experience in cultural, historical, and social contexts, and to do so through programs that foster human agency and social connectivity, as well as civic empowerment. Please check out all of our university and community engaged programs on our social media and also in our printed material, which you can find at that table to my left. Critical mass, the theme of this year's public events series, aims to bring into focus situations, challenges, constructions, collections, and collectives that command our attention. The series will be addressing topics ranging from the environmental impact of human life on the planet, to the social consequences of mass incarceration, to the ways in which people organize into activist coalitions. We will also have events focused on the passions that impel collectors and hoarders, the parallels between individual transformation and social change, and the impasses and intentions that have resulted in war and genocide. The series Critical Mass is a heterogeneous group of mass phenomena. But what unifies the elements, excuse me, but what unifies it is the element of critique that will run through all of the events, the systematic querying of limits that can become the basis for transformation in multiple registers. The work of our inaugural speaker Industrial ecologist Roland Geyer exemplifies this critical approach. A professor at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, he holds a graduate degree in physics from the Technical University of Berlin and a PhD in engineering from the University of Surrey. Before coming to UCSB, he held research positions at the Center for Environmental Strategy at the University of Surrey and France's Center for the Management of Environmental Resources. He has also been a consultant in financial risk management in Germany. Since 2000, he has worked with a wide range of governmental organizations, trade associations, and companies on environmental sustainability issues. Geyer's study of pollution prevention strategies keeps firmly in view the environmental performance of these strategies, as well as their economic viability and their technical and operational feasibility. You can see by his professional history and research objectives that his work is deeply interdisciplinary and critical, and why, therefore, it is the most compelling way to inaugurate our series, Critical Mass. After Roland's talk, English <coughs> professor Melody Jew, whose research concerns oceans and environmental humanities, will open up our post-lecture discussion, and then we will invite audience members to pose their questions as well. So please join me now in welcoming Roland Geyer to speak to us today about Plastic's Tipping Point. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very, very kind invitation. It's, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here at the Humanities across campus. I have to admit, I had to look up where the building is. That's how, <laughs> um, that's how urgent this interaction is. So finally it's happening. So this is, this is amazing. Um, so um, I, my plan now for the next, uh, say, 50 minutes is to um, entertain and depress you in equal measure. Um, this is sort of what this uh, subject uh, leads to. So we call it Plastic's Tipping Point. Um, you introduced me so nicely, don't need to say anything else. If you want to learn more about me and my work, then I uh, encourage you to go to my website. And let's just um, jump right into it. So, um, I, I am originally and still very much a numbers person, so I, I will throw a lot of numbers at you, at least initially. Um, and most of the data uh, are from these two publications that came out and got, uh, and that's sort of what got me thinking about response to data, response to science, got overwhelming uh, media attention. Uh, we did not expect that at all and uh, it's been sort of going on ever since. It turns out that um, you know, while we're still debating whether climate change is real or anthropogenic or even you know, a problem, uh, everyone hates plastic. It seems to be sort of the one thing that we can all agree on. So, so those two publications 
And then I'm trying to keep the data updated, and um, so a new updated version is coming out in this big volume, Plastic Waste and Recycling, March uh, 2020, so I got to write the second chapter. Uh, if you want to feel, if you feel like dropping $250 <laughs> on a book, this might, this might just be the ticket there. Um, all right. So, um, I, especially in, in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, uh, I, I, yesterday I came up with my own theory of change, <laughs> ignoring probably hundreds of years of social science. Um, and uh, as uh, modest as I am, I call it Roland's theory of change. Um, so here's your Roland's pentagon of how change happens. Okay, and um, so we uh, scientists we generate facts, and then my idea is that these facts will have an impact through media on people's perception about how things are, and in. Uh, it changed and uh, affect their attitudes um, about things, the public opinion, which then may or may not lead to action, right? This action could be individual, it could be corporate companies, it could be public, it could be policy, state, municipal level, federal level. And those actions that hopefully will lead to have some impacts in the real world, what I call outcomes, and these outcomes then change the facts. And uh, so there's your pentagon. <laughs> And so I'm trying, I'm very confident in the top one, not so much <laughs> with the other four, but I'm going to lean out of the window today and leave my, my comfort zone of, uh, of, of numbers, um, at least in the second half. First, the numbers. So um, plastic polymers, synthetic polymers, sort of the more official name. Polymer I learned is from polos and meros, means many parts. So. Um, it's a monomer and then just many, many, many of them put together. Polymerization, it's called. A uh, very young group of material. So we go straight to the bottom. So mass production, most people these days put mass production uh, in around 1950. So you know, a couple of million tons were produced before 1950, but you'll see in the grand scheme of things, it was really nothing. So it's, you know, let's just say 1950, roughly 70 years ago is when we started to mass produce plastics in earnest. Um, some early plastics um, date back uh, much further, celluloid, um, 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 a UK uh, inventor also called it Parkinson, wasn't completely synthetic since it was made out of uh, celluloid. The first completely synthetic uh, um, polymer was called Bakelite, and that in 1907, that has sort of a big you know, like a big impact back then, but compared to the amounts that we go through today, it's, it's, it's virtually nothing. And then you can see slowly all the modern types of plastic, plastics are being invented and then finally mass produced. So nylon, PVC was the first one actually, um, polyethylene, PET, polypropylene, and so on. And now, of course, we have a giant zoo, a, a zoo of uh, different polymers, so they're literally hundreds. Even though it turns out that you know, if we uh, care about lab, you know, the, the vast majority of plastic, we really only need to think about seven, eight, nine types of polymers. Um, and here they are. Um, and um, so those are the, the by far the most abundant plastics. Um, as you can see here, they, they have these little recycling codes, which come up, I think they, they came up in the late 70s, early 80s. They are numbered through. And you can see number one is what the soda bottles are made out of, HDPE, high density polyethylene, is what the laundry detergent bottle and many, many other uh, um, household containers are made out of. And there's PVC. A lot in, in your house is going to be full of PVC, even though you're not aware of it. The piping, window frames, door frames, you know, all of that is, uh, or a lot of that is PVC. Um, then films, grocery bags, they tend, to, they tend to be low density polyethylene, so that's number four. Polypropylene is sort of a, um, uh, it can do pretty much anything, so you'll find it everywhere. Um, and then polystyrene um, also, um, you know, comes as a 
foam form, so that it's um, a styrofoam, a little bit. And because of the styrene in it, it's sort of got a, a not so good reputation, and so lots of people are moving away from styrene, even in packaging. And then there's everything else. So, so um, just so you know, if uh, um, you know when you take your plastic uh, household containers and other goods and throw them in the blue bin, so they get sorted by these numbers. And to be honest, the you know, the, the local uh, MRF, as it's called, Material Recovery Facility, at the moment really only cares about number one and number two. So they typically, you know, they try and separate these plastics and then bail them in giant sort of seven, eight hundred pound bales. And then they have a number one bale, right, that's your soda bottles. They have a number two bale, that's all the detergent bottles. And then they have what they call three through seven. <laughs> so that's everything else. And currently those bales, no one, no one wants them. So if there's, you know, so basically, you know, at the moment we, you know, it's, we should be really kind of bother with three through seven, or find a way to make it usable again. So, so that's the first depressing fact. Um, <laughs> I have a few kitten videos right there. <laughs> I started doing that in my classes a little bit at the Brent Hall, and uh, it really works well. Um, and then uh, very briefly, there are two types of plastics. They're called thermoplastic, thermoset. I'm basically talking about the thermoplastics. So those are polymers that they melt when you heat them up, and then as they cool down, they go solid again. Okay, and that makes them potentially recyclable. Okay, all the other ones, the the, the red ones, you see, they're uh, are much fewer. They're called thermosets, and they do just that. They set, and um, then you can heat them up, and they they stay solid. So they are inherently you know much harder to reutilize uh, once they reach the end of their life. So uh, think surfboards, right, epoxy resin. Um, so those are the therm thermosets. Just put that out there, but really mostly we're talking about plastics. So let's sort of go through the life cycle of plastic, right? What's, uh, what's the life cycle of plastic? And then, you know, how does it end up in the environment? And then why do we care? When did we start caring and sort of taking from there? So, um, production. Um, so here it is. Um, this is um, all the data that we collected, right? It starts right, as you can see, that's not what we're looking for here. In 1950, you can see, right, it's basically zero compared to how much we made now. So it's just, that's the start of mass production. So it's 70 years old. Um, it's here, you can see it by polymer, you can see the growth rate is phenomenal, right? So um, the so-called compound annual growth rate of that 70 year stretch or 70, what is it, um, 67 year stretch is 8.3%, so that's roughly two and a half times the global GDP growth, right? So it's consistently and massively outgrown like even global GDP. So phenomenal growth, with, obviously you could on one hand, say that's, that's a great economic success story, or you can look at it and say, oh my god. Um, so there's sort of the, the, the two ways to think about that. Um, and you can see that the vast majority of all plastics that we make is just a handful of different types of plastic, right? You can see um, just the, the bottom four, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, already make up 50% of global production. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we were interested in was the additives. So we need to be aware that, you know, like uh, the lots of statistics that are out there is the pure polymer. It's just, you know, the, 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 the monomer polymerized. But uh, virtually every final finished plastic has additives in it. So those are very, can be very complex, complicated. Um, chemicals um, in order to change the, um, the properties of the material okay, in more useful ways or make it more flexible, make it light, stable, and uh, give it color, and so on. So we wanted to know how much additives are in there, and that's not really readily available. So um, it turns out it's about, you know, of, of all plastic polymer plus additives, about 70%, 8% is, is uh, um, additives are these chemicals. Okay. Then the other thing that we uh, were interested in 
Um, there is sort of a, a separate world in the plastic world, and it distinguishes between what they call resin, which is all the polymers that sort of, you know, these things are being made out of, or, you know, the packaging, or buckets, and, you know, children's toys, whatnot. And then there are fibers, okay? And uh, statistically speaking, more than half of you actually wear synthetic fibers rather than natural fibers. Um, so there's been also explosive growth in synthetic fibers, and most people don't think of it as wearing plastic, but actually that's what you do. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, like this, uh, the most popular is polyester, which is chemically identical to PET, that number one plastic, which is the soda bottle, which is why soda bottles are so easy to recycle, well, not easy, I should say, but can be recycled into fleeces, right, or other polyester. And it turns out that um, fiber also makes up a huge chunk of the total these days, and it's growing. So it's 40% of all plastic is actually not what you might think of it as plastic, but you know stuff that is actually that's hanging from you know your windows or uh, or, or your frame <laughs> that you're wearing. Um, so there's that. Um, the vast majority is polyester, and then there's nylon, also known as polyamide, and acrylic is kind of going out of fashion. Um, if you wear it, you'll understand why. <laughs> uh, one of the issues, of course, is um, you know, 2017 we made 438 million metric tons. Okay, so how much is that? Um, and I'm trying later. I'll try sort of to get you know, and that's one of the issues. With, with, with us to communicate these findings, right? Because if you do this for 20 years, you know, you look at this, you, we've studied metals for, you know, for decades, and suddenly we look at this number and say, oh my God, that is, that is an unbelievable amount, right? So aluminum production, annual global aluminum production is maybe 65 million metric tons. That's the second most produced metal. On the, on, on, in, in the world. So that's just to give you sort of a perspective of just what an outrageous, incredible amount that is. And then of course, just one year, that's 2017. So 2018 is going to come up, and at some point the statistic will come out and it's going to be large. <coughs> we already know that. Uh, quickly about the additives. Um, so, you know, some things are probably fairly innocuous. Those are fillers, right? that's just to basically make plastic cheaper. Others are not so much, right? You might have heard about the whole bisphenol A controversy, right? This endocrine disruptor that they used to put into polycarbonate. At least algae bottles are made out of, so those are an example of plasticizers. Of course, flame retardants um, are very problematic and are known to be hazardous. And then there are lots and lots of other chemicals, uh, many of which aren't really characterized. Uh, in, in terms of their health impact or their ecological impact. So we don't even know whether they're bad. We just know that we can get, you know, their performance, performance enhanced. So that's, that's a whole kind of different uh, problem with those uh, additives, not just the polymer itself. Um, so we've looked at uh, production by uh, polymer. Now this is just briefly showing you by, by application, basically. So the one thing don't need to dwell on it. The, the one thing you'll see is that, you know, when somewhere between, oops, wrong way, somewhere on, on between a third and, um, and um, whatever comes next, between 30 and 40 percent uh, is packaging, just packaging alone. So Jack, packaging, lot, you know, most, lots of it, or most of it is going to be single-use packaging. So we're literally going to use that once and then um, we're going to um, discard it, right? Um, so it's a, it's a really, really big piece of that plastic pie, so it's no surprise, it makes a lot of sense that um, you know, policy makers are focusing on, or NGOs are focusing on packaging, right? It's, we're using so much and we're using it very carelessly, right? Just because it's so cheap. Um, the next, the largest one may be surprising, but maybe not, that's actually in construction. Okay, so those are what I mentioned earlier, the pipes, um, everything else in your building that, that, is, you know, that, that uh, needs to be a very solid, long-lasting plastic um, is, uh, ends up in construction. And then the third largest already is uh, apparel. So those are fibers. Right? So 
that's how, how big and growing that market is. All right, so that was production. Um, so you've seen phenomenal growth does not seem to you know, level off any time soon. Uh, what are we using it for? Um, so here's just a little uh, breakdown. It's, this is for Europe, but it's, it's roughly also true in the US or even globally speaking. So the applications are, are, are roughly consistent across the globe. Um, so you can see the number one is really mostly used for soda bottles and increasingly clamshells, of, of course, if you know what I mean, your strawberries, right? Um, and uh, it seems like increasingly everything you buy is, ends up in a clamshell, whether you want it or not, it's in a clamshell. So I'm actually going to, in a month, I'm going to talk uh, up in Watsonville and Driscoll's because they are feeling the heat, <laughs> as you can imagine. You know, they're kind of in the business of berries and clamshells in a way. They're trying to figure out what to do. Um, I hope I get lots of feedback. Um, <laughs> and probably not. Um, POR, polyurethane, so those are foams. Okay, so we had mentioned those earlier, mattresses, uh, insulation panels. PVC, here it is again, right? You can see here's your window frame, uh, the piping, uh, HDPE, right? Here are your, so it's, it's already, you know these things already, right? Your detergent bottle, um, low density plastic bags, film, polypropylene, right? That's the sort of uh, uh, jack of all trades. You can really use it for pretty much anything, super versatile and then everything else, right? It's the polycarbonate of the Nalgene bottle, and so on. I mean, plastic, once you look, you know, plastics, it's just everywhere. I just read the other day that actually, you know, cars um, are basically sort of by volume, 50% is plastic now, um, and so are airplanes also. So that's just how much we're using. Um, okay, that's the use. So, and then we use it, and, um, Everything, and that's one of the things I really want to point out, everything that we make, every single piece of material is going to be waste at some point. Right? And don't fool yourself, like even if we successfully recycle it, it's still going to be waste at some point, because we're not going to use it forever. Right? And maybe you get one cycle out of it, maybe you get six cycles out of it, which is extremely unlikely uh, in the case of plastic, but at some point it's going to be waste. Um, so every piece of material plastic we ever made is gonna, is gonna be wasted at some point. So, um, and as we know, and of course household waste is just one kind of waste, right? There's waste at the factories, there's waste in logistics, there's waste in the, uh, in the distribution centers, uh, behind every storefront, right? There's this waste. So this is really just the tip of the waste burden, right? Um, but household waste generation, um, just a couple of examples for you non-metric people, I converted it into pounds. Um, so now it doesn't mean anything for me anymore. Um, and I think this is two and a half kilogram. Um, so you can see, right, there's, there's quite a bit of range, right? There are countries that generate, according to those statistics, less than a kilogram of waste per capita per day. And then, of course, there's a question of how much of this is plastic. In the US, we think currently it's about 13% by mass, right? The uh, vast majority being paper and cardboard, but then plastic is sort of on the rise. Um, so a while ago, it was probably more like 10%, and a while ago, it was probably more like 6%. So that fraction is on the rise. So just to sort of give you, you know, uh, some rough idea of kind of where we are, and these, these numbers are currently sort of still ticking up. So everything's becoming waste at some point, uh, and then the question is, you know, what, uh, how much is it? What are we doing with it? Um, so there are, and I took a few slides out because I realized there's probably a, a limit for <laughs> how many of these charts you want to digest. But here are just two things I'd like to point out, uh, which I think are interesting. Um, you know, the use phase, you know, like, imagine you buy things and then you you have it in your home and then it's in use for a while before it becomes waste and goes out of it. So think of your use phase like sort of a reservoir of materials, right? So your household is like an in-use reservoir of all kinds of you know, stuff basically and plastic also. Um, and uh, some of that plastic 
will be in use for a couple of years, right? So we buy it today and then it becomes waste maybe in four years, maybe if it's you know, some apparel, or maybe in 10 years uh, if it's you know, some, some household item, um, or in a couple of weeks if it's packaging. So, so there's a delay, which basically means that every year more, since plastic production still increases year over year over year, um, every year more plastic goes into use than leaves the use space. So this use, in use stock that we could call it, our, our homes and you know, every, everywhere else, is still increasing plastic. Right? So actually currently we think that's roughly about 3 billion metric tons in that use space globally. And of course, hopefully, it does, you know, it does something useful. Very often, it does not. Actually, it just kind of sits around. Um, but basically, it's all waste in the waiting, right? So all that three billion metric tons is going to be waste at some point, right? It's just sitting there waiting to become waste. Not quite, but uh, um, so here you can see we think that you know in the year 2017. Uh, we made 438 million metric tons, while 328 million metric tons became waste. Right? Okay. Left our households and all you know, shops and uh, everything else, libraries, whatnot, as waste. So the next question. Oh, and the other interesting thing, well, at least for me, is that uh, because these different applications have different lifetimes, there is a big reshuffle in. Of, you know, in the size of the fractions coming out, because imagine the where is construction? Construction is green, right? So construction goes in in 2017 and hopefully doesn't come out for decades, right? That's the hope and the idea. Whereas packaging goes in in the year and probably leaves again, right? In the same year, right? Maybe in the, the same week. Um, so you see that in waste generation. The, the packaging fraction is even larger than in production, if that makes any sense. But it just moves through the use phase. So, so now, you know, it's it's getting close to 50% of the waste generation is all just packaging. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, so that's waste. So moving on, and um, so what happens to all of this? Um, so that's what we also really wanted to know, and that's the hardest thing to find out. Actually, production is the easiest because the industry actually <coughs> publishes production data. They just have to sort of cross check and bring everything together. Um, waste generation is already hard, right? Um, it's sort of like the job of the EPA, for example, to sort of quantify waste generation, and it kind of works. And you know, lately, they've, they've sort of not done such a great job. And then fake, of course, is then also can be really difficult, in particular if, like we used to do, uh, we collect all the recyclable plastic and then send half or 60% off to Asia to, you know, to have it taken care of. Then we basically lost every audit trail and we have actually no idea what happened. And until, I would say, 18 months ago, pretty much everyone said, yeah, it's going to get recycled. Because why would they pay money for it? Wasn't. And that it suddenly turns out that oh my god it doesn't get recycled, and so that's you know that, I think that's kind of pushed everyone over the edge, right? It's that realization that, that plastic recycling is in shambles, it's especially now that um, uh, China has implemented what they call the national sorting policy right, in uh, January 2018, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. So um, here's the U.S. <laughs> it's um, this is plastic waste generation. So those are EPA figures, right? Federal EPA. So um, you can see how the absolute amount of plastic waste generated keeps growing. And you can see that until the late 80s, right? People didn't even bother with recycling. And then, you know, recycling became a thing in the late 80s. Interestingly, was the idea was because people thought we were running out of landfills. That was sort of the initial motivation for recycling. It was not to preserve virgin resources. It was to preserve landfill space. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see where you know, like in the US, we are we are appalling at plastic recycling. It can't be said any other way. I don't think everyone anyone argues. Like even in the industry, no one argues with the fact that 
plastic recycling is appalling in the US. So even the federal EPA says that ah, it's 9% uh, That's, you know, obviously in California, you know, it's different state to state, so it's important to point that out. Um, so how does that compare to, say, some other <laughs> developed economies? Um, so this is what Europe, well, actually that's what plastic Europe's, so that's the plastics, European, Association of European Plastics Manufacturers, right? So they might want these numbers to look good, right? To keep that in mind. But that's what they say <laughs> is happening. So they say that just between 2006 and 2016, land flow rate actually dropped from 52% to 27. Okay. That's what they're saying. Uh, they, uh, Europe incineration is a completely you know, acceptable way to get rid of plastic, right? I know here. I mustn't even say like incineration is a bad word. I had to learn this when I when I moved out here. You know, with back, you know, I said, so what about incineration? You can't say that. You have to say waste to energy or some you know <laughs> conversion <laughs> technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's incineration. <laughs> um, so it's a bad word here. So um, I think you know I, I'm not sure what happens to incineration. But in Europe, it's not. So you can see it's actually you know they incinerate officially a lot more than they recycle, but in their recycling rate, they say, you know, ticked up from 20 to about 30 so. percent. Um, what is interesting is, right, obviously, Europe is many, many different countries, so here's just, you know, I'm not going to bore you walking you through it, but you can see, you know, there's, it's very, very different from country to country. So on the left are the overachievers, right, so you could, the usual suspects, Scandinavia, Holland, Germany. Um, and then over there, it sort of gets redder and redder, right? That red is land too. <clears throat> and you can see that Switzerland basically says that we don't use landfill, right? Because it's actually banned. Plastic is banned from landfill in Switzerland. But, you know, like they incinerate, you know, like 78%. Mm -hmm. And that's completely okay there. Um, anyway, Germany likes to think of itself as, you know, like recycling champions of the world, not just soccer champions, but recycling champions also. And uh, so let's have a closer look. You know, it's really interesting. There was actually uh, a report that came out very early January this year uh, from colleagues from the Wuppertal Institute in Germany. And they basically said, okay, your official recycling number that you, that you put out is like almost 39%. And then they really dug into the numbers and the accounting and everything. <laughs> and they said, now, you know, like maybe it's 70%. Okay, so that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big difference, right? That's less than half. So that's quite shocking, right? That somehow, you know, like a country as, you know, like as mature and statistically sophisticated as Germany should you know, should, should have this going on, where they say, oh, our recycling is 39%. No, it's not. 17%. Right? So that's, that's quite shocking. So those, those numbers, you know, you have to be careful, uh, which is why it takes forever to sort of get, get worked on. Yeah. And then you're still one of them. Anyway, so there's that. Um, so we were interested in putting, you know, building a global model. And that's what we think, no, that's our best estimate of what we think is happening globally. Okay. So, um, yes, right, incineration rate has gone up steady, uh, uh, steadily, right? We started here at 1980 because we think that basically was no recycling in, in formal incineration prior to 1980. And recycling is sticking up steadily, so maybe it's at 20% now, okay, globally. This, um, our paper gets cited a lot and then everyone says, oh, did you know the global recycling rate is only 9%? And I always have to say, no, that's the historical recycling rate. That's the recycling rate of all plastic we ever made. Right? And of course, the recycling rate was at some point was zero and it creeped up. So historical average is 9%. Now, maybe we're at 20%. Um, here is an uptick in incineration, which kind of, yeah, we chose to believe. Um, China apparently has dramatically increased um, its incineration capacity. So that's sort of what's going on. So big that it, you, know, you see it in the, in the, in the global statistic as a, as a big gap. So that's what we think is happening. Um, and if you apply those rates to the waste generation, that's kind of what we see, right? You see that um, 
with that uptick in incineration and with the steadily growing recycling and incineration, you know, while total waste generation just keeps rising like really dramatically. Currently, you know, it's so it made a little dent in the what we call discard rate. Okay, that's a bit of a weird word. It's for a discard is basically um, proper landfill and dumping. Okay, so because it just, we really everyone says yeah, but what's you know like what's landfill and what's dumped? And we say no one knows. It's it's simply not known uh, globally, right? How much ends up in a proper well-managed sanitary landfill and how much is, is in open dumps, right? So it's, it's anyone's guess. I, I wish we could um, figure that out, but currently we can't. Um, so it's still, as you can see, you know, it's crept past the 200 million tons per year mark. So it's, it's an outrageous amount. So once you realize that, then you may be no longer surprised that you read, you know, headlines that say like, oh, every year millions of tons of plastic end up in that's just a couple of percent of the discarded plastic. Right? Um, so how much ends up in the ocean? Again, no one really exactly knows. Um, Eunomia, they weren't the most thorough, but they are the boldest. <laughs> they just put numbers on everything. And half of the numbers, we have no idea where they're coming from. But they, they kind of look about right. <laughs> OK. Uh, Actually, some of my colleague and, and I, we just recalculated one of them, the synthetic microfibers that we believe end up where the microfibers, textiles here, um, that end up in the ocean. And we, we have a completely different model that we actually know how we did it. I'm not sure you know really knows how they did it, but uh, the number actually isn't all that far apart. Which is, uh, I don't know why we bought it for that, right? Do you know that one? Um, should have said 42. Um, and uh, anyway, so it's, it's, it's many million tons end up in the ocean. Um, so they say 12, maybe it is 12. You know, this is actually our number um, from the 2015 publication. It's actually eight, I don't know how it became a nine, but uh, um, it doesn't matter, right? We actually put out a range. We say it's anywhere between four and a half and 12 and a half. And four and a half is bad news, so I don't need eight to so start with. Uh, pull my hair out. Um, so uh, it's really, really bad news. Um, obviously, uh, it also ends up on land, right? It's just that currently everyone's worried about the ocean. That's one of, one of the strange things of the plastic issue is that, you know, if, if a whale shows up full of uh, plastic bags, everyone is, uh, you know, outraged. Um, you know, what about elephants? So, okay. Um, so on, on land, the issue must be just as big. Right? It doesn't, it, it just doesn't get as much uh, media attention. Uh, then the other thing, of course, if we focus on the ocean, is like where is it on the ocean? And I'm sure you all heard, uh, or maybe you all heard of the ocean cleanup, Boyan Slut, the young dynamic man from Holland. Um, he, I mean, there was just news the other day that this giant boom that he put out, which is made out of plastic, ironically, um, <laughs> actually collected some plastic, right, because it didn't first and then it broke, and now it's collected some plastic, which is great. So people ask me, yeah, you know, did we do it? And I said, probably not, because there's increasing scientific consensus that floating on the surface of the ocean is probably, you know, like one or two percent of all the plastic. Right? So it doesn't matter how great the boom is, he's going after one or two percent of the plastic. And I think that's like why. I'm sure they're you know like good for you and great for the effort, but is that the best way to spend that money? Then you know that's the question I want to put out there. Um, most people think that actually the vast majority of plastic in the ocean actually sinks uh, at some point to the ocean floor. Average depth of the sea floor is 14,000 feet. I googled, so good luck cleaning <laughs> the ocean floor. So that's not going to happen. So I think what that means is we need to keep the, the, the plastic out of the ocean in the first place rather than trying to clean it up. So, um, cumulative, very briefly. Um, 
So because we start at the dawn of mass production, we can add it all up, right? And then we can actually say, well, this is all plastic humankind has ever made, right? By just adding up over the years. It turns out to be now with, uh, including 2017, 9.2 billion metric tons, right? So an enormous amount of money, uh, money, that too, uh, amount of material, um, and that no one can visualize. Like, even I sort of get lost at that point. Right. So, uh, of course, when we started, when we were about to publish this, and you can see, you know, the last, you know, about not quite eighty percent was discarded. Right? So, uh, the, the last majority. So we knew that we would have to come up with some visualizations. Okay. So we we spent the whole evening sort of thinking about like, oh, you know, how do we? Is it football fields? Is it you know? Let's let's pile it up in Manhattan. Like, you know, like what do we do? And so. Uh, we came up with those things. Um, so it's 1.2 billion elephants a mass, it's 88 million blue whales, it's 900,000 Eiffel Towers. Still kind of doesn't mean much, right? And, so, uh, and then I did that thought experiment and you know, assumed the average density of plastic trash and sort of took the amount and spread it out uh, sort of ankle deep. And it turns out I could cover Argentina ankle deep. I didn't do that actually, but uh, I could. <laughs> um, so Argentina is the eighth largest country in the world. <coughs> just to sort of, so that sort of, I think gives you a sense. Actually, there's an there's an artist. Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, the crazy thing because of that incredible growth that plastic <coughs> experience, um, half of all plastic humankind has ever made was made in the last 13 years. So actually after I arrived at UCSB. So I came to UCSB, started working not quite on plastics, and since then we doubled the total amount of plastic that we ever made. That's that's how crazy that is. So my you know that that was since my daughter was born. Um, so just so that for me is like the most powerful number. There's actually an artist uh, in Germany, Bronco. Um, and he also really wanted to visualize this amount and help people visualize this. So he, he did this project, um, and his thought experiment was to basically fill up the Matterhorn with plastic. And he realized he could fill up the Matterhorn and then and then some. So he you know has sort of a, he has an, an art installation there at uh, at some hut close to the Matterhorn, which I thought was very cool, <coughs> uh, but uh, haven't seen yet. Maybe. All right, here we are. All the data now. Perception and attitude. So that's where I'm starting to um, leave <laughs> my comfortable territories and um, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so I do think that there is, you know, like things. You know, there's reality, and then we perceive it in some way, and then it, you know, like informs beliefs, attitudes value something, I don't know, something like that. Um, so how does that work? And first I thought, well, why plastic, right? Because everything else we make also grows, right? So here I just put that out. Um, this is just indexed to one in 1975. <coughs> everything grows, right? Cement production increases, right? There's no cement panic, right? There's no particles about, oh, the cement crisis. Um, um, Aluminum dust, right? Um, steel, I mean, you know, in all fairness, steel, we already made so much in 1975, it's kind of amazing that we managed to more than double that amount of annual output, right? So you need to kind of put those things in a historical perspective, same with aluminum. Um, but then I put it, you know, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion, they have doubled since 1975. Um, so everything is growing, right? You know, but then when I put this together, I realized, okay, so plastic is growing a lot faster than everything else. So there is that, right? And I don't know, maybe we have a sense of that somehow, that, you know, like in the world that surrounds it is, yes, there is steel, right? But there's plastic just shows up more and more and more, right? Um, so I don't know, that's, I, want, I, you know, I wanted to show the opposite, basically. And then I saw, you know, I, I threw it on a graph, and oh, that's interesting, right? It kind of sticks up. Um, and then I sort of put important 
marine plastic marine debris things on a timeline. I was just I wanted to see that, you know, because we were talking about um, right tipping points, critical. So where's the tipping point exactly? Right. You can see that um, you know if we just look at production, there isn't there isn't really a tipping point, right? It just keeps going up. Right? If you want to reduce plastic production, uh, you need a recession. <coughs> right? That's what's what's happening here. Right? That was the great recession. That's a, you know. That's kind of we learn that as industrial ecologists. If you want to, if you want to reduce CO two emissions, you need a recession. That's the surefire way to reduce CO two emissions. Um, you know, car production needs a recession, and car production goes down. Um, so, so that's you know, in case you wonder what that is, that's what that is. But other than that, look, I mean, how it rebounded, right? It, it seems like they were just waiting out for a year and then just you know, go straight back at it. Um, so in 75, there was a report by the National Academy of Science on ocean pollutants. It was about stuff that ends up in the ocean. Um, I actually bought that book, um, you know, somewhere from a used book center for a dollar. I feel very uh, good about that. And uh, it doesn't even talk about plastic at all. It's not. It talks a little bit about fishing gear and mostly about lost cargo. That's what it talks about. It's not surprising, right? Just there was so, so little plastic we made, right? so it wasn't even on the radar screen there. Um, having said that, in 87, it turns out, there was one EPA report, federal EPA report, you know, done contract report, called Plastic in the Oceans More Than a Litter Problem. So that was the earliest I could find where actually plastic in the ocean turned up as an environmental issue. And they were saying, this is, you know, when they say more than a litter, they mean more than a nuisance something, an actual threat. So I thought it was really interesting. And clearly this thing, right? When we started recycling right around there, had really nothing to do with plastic, and it was all about paper and glass and metals. Um, and it was about keeping stuff out of landfill. Right? This is um, in 92, <laughs> I thought this is sort of red. I don't know if you remember, uh, but there, were, there was this one container full of rubber ducks in the middle of the Pacific that went overboard and also opened up. So we suddenly had 28,000 rubber ducks um, in the Pacific kind of moving around. Actually, scientists used it to study ocean currents. And one journalist wrote a book about it. Um, and I put it out there because I kind of remember reading about that. And it was all the coverage was funny. That was funny back then. We saw the ha 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 ha, 28,000 rubber ducks in the ocean. I'm pretty sure people wouldn't write that up as a funny story <laughs> anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, so clearly not. 97 was when Charles Moore came back for the first time. You know, Al Galita based in LA, Captain Charles Moore, um, came back and reported of the Great Pacific Garbage Crash. Okay, so that was in 97. <laughs> And I do believe at that point also people weren't there. I don't think it got a lot of traction, to be honest. Um, and then in 2006, I found out there was a big conference here in San Diego about plastic marine debris, uh, jointly organized by Charles Ward and by the uh, California Coastal Commission. And they even came out with a plastic debris project. And it's still all on the internet. It's all very professionally done. You know, it's, it looks. It could have. Done, it could have been done like yesterday, honestly. And I think it's fair to say 2006 it, again it got zero traction, um, right? And at this point, we're you know we're close. We're closing in on 300 million tons of <coughs> plastic production. So that's for me that's fast. And I think, and others think that too, that something happened around 2010, 2012, 2015. Something happened, and suddenly plastic marine debris started to be a really big deal. And it started to pop up in the media, and it's never been gone since then. That's the crazy thing. It's never been gone since, I would say, at least 2014 to 2015. Um, and I think this, you know, <laughs> The national solar policy just sort of adds insult to injury, right? Because at that point, um, China said, you know, we don't want your contaminated recyclables anymore. So you need, if you want to send us your plastic bales, they need to have less than half a percent of pollution uh, contamination. 
and then basically that destroyed the recycling market because that's not how we collect plastic. Right? The way we throw it in the blue bin, half a percent is, is, is very, very, very difficult. Um, and then there's the other thing, but that seems to be more a, who knows, Blue Planet 2? Just a few bit. That, that was a big UK thing. In the UK, you know, uh, uh, David Attenborough making all these lovely name BBC nature programs. So it was Blue Planet, and then it was Blue Planet 2. Blue Planet was all about lovely, you know, everything was, was fine. And Blue Planet 2 was suddenly about, no, it's not fine. <laughs> you know, they, they showed lovely animals and they said, oh yeah, and by the way, they're only half the amount they were like just 10 years ago. So they got pretty gritty. And there was the last episode that had seven minutes just on ocean plastic. And in the UK, they talk about a Blue Planet 2 effect. Like, you know, where suddenly, and, and really from then onwards, um, suddenly the, you know, like the politicians in the UK started talking about the you know, uh, plastic plague and, and um, we have to do something about it. Theresa May made a big speech about you know, how this is a terrible legacy for us to leave behind. And, uh, um, so very, very interesting. So, so that's where we are right now. Um, I think the other thing is that, right? I mean, look at those images, right? You, I mean, you look at it and think, oh my god. It's, you know, they, those are powerful images. Um, and you go on the internet and, you know, there are literally hundreds of them. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't know which one to choose. And that's just skills, right? Um, uh, this woman made a whole, you know, movie about where these sort of, dis you know, actually showed what happens in the Maldives, right, which we think of as these gorgeous, unspoiled islands, um, where the trash goes, right? It's not a secret, right? It's never been a secret, but suddenly she goes out there and films these trash islands, um, and suddenly think, oh my god, you know, like, I'm I'll never go to the Maldives. I could possibly sort of scuba dive over there and have all my water bottles sent you know, down the road. Uh, it's just uh, impossible. And then, of course, those images, right? Um, I mean, those, those are you know, iconic images. I mean, um, and I think that has something to do with it, right? Um, in particular, why we care about those are iconic photographs, right? They win prizes. I mean, those are, you know, <laughs> for better or worse, those animals are famous. Um, they need an agent. Um, so this, you know, uh, this was a. Th those are all famous. This this little guy probably single hand single handedly responsible probably for every single plastic straw man on the planet is is is, is this person. Uh, and uh, so so there it is. Yeah. So it's got something to do with that. But I, I'd love to, I mean, you know, I suddenly realized this, this is not what I do for a living, so I need to talk to someone who actually does, because I think this is important. Why, why does that resonate in such a powerful way that other things don't? Um, so, can I take a few more minutes? I'd like to talk just, yeah, a bit about actions and impacts. So, now we talk about perception, attitudes which we know are very, very powerful, to the point that I hear that you know, some of the scientists in the plastic marine debris, when they get interviewed right, to the 12th time a week, that they sort of you know, kind of downplay at that point. You know, usually you're a scientist, you get super excited that you know, a reporter calls like, oh my god, they want to know about your work. I think they are at the point where they say, like, oh, can't you write a story about climate change? <laughs> Please, you know, like, yes, it's, a, it's an issue, but Right? There are other issues, but there might be bigger issues. Um, so, interest. Actions, right? Um, lots of actions happening. Um, just very briefly, um, there's a, you know, we can, and that's again, I'm on third territory, I can talk about this. What can you actually do? Right? So, in our world, we distinguish between remediation, right? So, pollution happened, now we have to clean it up. Uh, pollution control, right? In the case of plastic, it's essentially landfill or incineration, right? So we have it, now we have to deal with it, right? So either we put it in a hole or we burn it and then it's gone, right? The interesting thing is, I don't know if you ever thought about it, the only, since plastic doesn't biodegrade, the only way to make plastic disappear from the planet is actually incineration. Otherwise, it will just be there, you know, probably for a you know, couple of hundred years. So that's, that's a little weird thing to think about. 
right? All those, the one that we didn't incinerate, I think it's like 6 billion, 6.3 billion metric tons, it's somewhere. Right? It's somewhere on this planet and it's accumulating. Anyway, pollution control, and then, right, there's the thing, we could actually try and prevent pollution. Um, and we can do that in basically three ways we can prevent pollution. We can, or, you know, something that's awkwardly termed, but that's now the official term, source reduction. So basically, you just use less, right? So you're going to get your cucumbers without that little stupid sleeve, or you're going to get your tomatoes without a clamshell, and so on, so on, so on. That's just packaging, right? Then there's reuse and recycling, right, used again. Um, the important thing with reuse and recycling is, and actually this even underappreciated, I feel, in my view, is that environmentally speaking, the only point of recycling is to reduce virgin material production. It's, it's the only, that's the only reason we recycle, if we care about the environment. Okay, I can't, I've written papers about it, but you know, like, have a think about it. That's the only way, like, See, people say, ah, but what about diversion from landfill? I said, well, recycling is just delaying landfill. It doesn't avoid landfill, right? Because it's still there. So it's going to become waste at some point. Right? The only way recycling actually reduces landfill is by us making less new material. So we're using recycled material instead of new material. Okay? In the, for plastic, there's actually frustratingly little evidence that that happens. First of all, we recycle so little plastic, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that we're actually using recycled plastic just on top of all the other plastic, primary okay. So, bad news. And then material substitution, right? That's, that's sort of a standard one, right? Where people say, okay, we can't have plastic straws, now we just go back to paper straws. And then of course, someone will dig out an environmental assessment from 1992 that says, oh, paper is just as bad as plastic, right? Then you're suddenly in the whole world of, you know, the, 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 uh, the formal assessment method is called life cycle assessment, right? There. So, I mean, it's, it's premature these days. So, um, basically, what I'm saying is if we just substitute one material for the other, right, we're probably going to substitute one environmental impact for another environmental impact. Or we're just going to shift the burden really from one place to another. So, you know, it, it gets complicated at that point. Which is why I own this, right? Like even my kids in elementary school, they learn this what they who's heard of the waste hierarchy? Barely anyone. Um, so reduce, reuse, recycle. Have you heard of that? That's the waste hierarchy. Okay, so yeah. Um, anyway, my kids learn it, right? So use, reuse, recycle. But, but somehow by the time we're grown-ups, apparently we have forgotten that, right? We go straight to recycling. And then we upset that it doesn't work, right? So reduction is the thing that trumps the whole time. Somehow seems to be the hardest. Um, what is being done about plastic pollution? <coughs> Stuff is happening, right? In the US, so I got this uh, from my friends at Surfrider Foundation. They say it very proudly that they're literally behind almost every single one of those bands. Um, so you can see there is plastic ban is happening, right? Uh, it's the usual suspects, right? It's West Coast, uh, New England, there's Texas, there's Florida. Um, so some of that is happening. Um, of course, then, you know, always very quick people are saying, yeah, but that's just bags, right? That's what, what, what difference does that make? Maybe it's a start. Um, it's a global phenomenon. Banning very offensive items definitely sort of happens all over the world and not just in developed economies but everywhere as you can see. Uh, and some of those fines in the developing economies are really fierce, like Kenya apparently is like really fierce about plastic back then. Probably more fierce than we are here because what happened in California, which I find really irritating, if I now go to my supermarket, I figure I, you still can have plastic bags. Did you notice that they're still there? I kind of think they, I got to smart and find uh, Not always, but sometimes. And they're still there. And I think that what I called my friend at Carl Recycle. I said, well, what happened? You banned those bags. And, yeah, they are reusable. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> like, who's reusing them? So it doesn't matter. It, it's, you know, like, it counts as a reusable bag because of the cake, because of the thickness. So that's how they get around still reusing plastic bags, even though we have a plastic bag. 
Anyway, don't get me started. Um, and then, but there are other things happening, right? Uh, the EU has really come out, is trying something on the, on the European level. So there's now the European strategy for plastics and circular economy. And they are, they, uh, the parliament has passed a single-use plastics directive. So now it needs to go through the other chamber, the council. Uh, ministers, um, so it will, I'm pretty sure it will become a directive, and then the member states will have to implement, implement, you know, ban on selected items, and as you can imagine, those, um, those hygiene, Q I call them Q-tips, what do you call those things, those cotton pad, cotton swabs, yeah, those are banned, right, because, because, you, you know, I'm sure it's because of the, the little seahorse, right, <laughs> um, and so on, so they're trying, uh, California is, is trying really hard, right? as you can see, um, just a couple of examples, single-use plastic straws, only upon request, that was still uh, signed by Governor Brown. Uh, this just passed, that is actually very cool, progressive, progressively in, uh, increasing recycled content mandate uh, for plastic beverage containers. So they're basically trying to create a market for recycled materials so that recycling finally might actually work. Um, and then, of course, I don't know if you kind of follow the news that has stalled currently. There are these, this is super big, they are identical um, acts in, uh, in the Assembly and the Senate. And they're like super ambitious, but also super, super big. So whether, you know, how they're going to work out, it's currently kind of everyone's guess. Like even like right now it's stalled because they didn't have the votes uh, on, the, uh, on the floor to move this forward, and they're out of session now, so it's going to come back in 2020. Um, problem is that you know, there, will, there will be very vague language in a bill like this, and then my colleagues at CalRecycle, right, the department at the California EPA, then has to figure out, what does recycle really mean? Okay, and they're currently trying to make that you know, like have some teeth, right, because it's, that's actually my most hated word in the recycling world, is, is recyclable. What does that mean? Give me a million dollars, I'll recycle it. Whatever it is, I'll recycle it. Um, so, so there's that. So we'll see. So that's all ongoing. And what's also ongoing at the moment, you know, this currently has no outcomes, right? This is all policy that will play itself out, some, you know, some of which um, small stuff is playing itself out, the big stuff not yet. But at the same time, and you know, now we're going back to the pressing, um, Virgin plastic production capacity keeps growing. Okay? Like we had 440 million metric tons per year, and we're putting new production capacity in place. For me, that is just that's total madness. That which for me would be like the obvious thing, that's the first thing we'll stop. Right? Before we do anything, before we ban anything or put a boom out in the ocean, we say, okay, 400 million tons a year is enough. Obviously, there's no, you know, like how do you implement that? Right? There's no way to do this. So there was a, a shell in Pennsylvania, in Beaver Valley, it's building like as big as it gets, the, the, they say. Um, and uh, a million metric tons of capacity will be added in polyethylene. Um, the woman I got interviewed in the New York Times article, which is in charge of building the plant, then at some point also said, oh yeah, Michelle is totally committed to recycling. We're passionate about oh, recycling. Sure. So why don't you build a recycling plant? <laughs> if you're so passionate about recycling, it's just a, I call BS from that. Um, and yeah, you can see, you know, one of the ironies as sort of, as we started to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels for energy, that stuff wants to go somewhere, and that gets pushed into petrochemicals. The biggest one is plastic. And that's probably why this plant is here, because there's just so much fracking gas, and the byproduct product is ethane. And that is what you make polyethylene out of. So that's happening at the same time as all this great policy you know, goes into place, and NGOs like the Surf Rider Foundation doing all this great work. So this is this is kind of where we are. So in a way, I think you know, the, the whole fight, if anything, has just started, quite frankly. Um, ready for a kitten video? <laughs> uh, don't have a kitten video. Sorry. So if we, if plastic, if virtual plastic production grows as it currently grows, 
then you know, by 2050, the annual output will be 1.1 billion metric tons. That's my final number. So I know we need that kit million, but that's okay. Anyway, thank you so much for your time and uh, listening to that. I know it's not all fun, but it's it's happening, right? It's happening, so you have to think about that. English, um, and I think I'm going to try to hit the golden medium of speaking long enough for you to come up with questions, but not so long that you get bored. Uh, so we'll make that into my chair. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for your talk. Um, really appreciate uh, the context you put your work in, and I think that uh, what I'm going to try to do is offer a few humanities uh, touchstones and connections with uh, what you what you spoke about. Uh, so. The story you tell about plastic um, is that it surrounds us. It's everywhere um, in documentaries like the film Baggett. You can see either sort of the surreal scene where someone walks down the aisle of a grocery store and is aware of just how much plastic surrounds all of the food. And so you can do this exercise anywhere you go shopping, just count the amount of plastic you see when you pass through a space, um, or even your own home. And it's, uh, it's sort of astounding how much how easy it is to forget that unless you make a conscious effort to uh, see how that plastic uh, surrounds. Um, and so uh, one of the things I appreciate about uh, your research and your, your talk um, is the, um, the care with which you uh, attend to data. Um, so in humanity, sometimes we talk about an optical unconscious, uh, the way that film or video uh, can capture something we don't notice otherwise. I think that what you're presenting is a kind of data unconscious. So you're measuring something that would pass our observation um, and we would completely ignore unless um, someone made the effort to, uh, to measure it. Um, I also want to, uh, and so I have a friend who uh, has studied uh, uh, waste documentaries around China and Beijing, especially uh, this one uh, called Beijing Besieged by Waste, where you can see that dumps have actually been placed in a circle as a kind of eighth ring around the entire city. Uh, and as he was uh, writing about this particular documentary, um, the sort of bell stuff for him was something from Freud. So like, which, in a way, the waste is a kind of uh, return of the repressed from consumerism. So it's something that we don't want, that we're producing all the time, we don't want to you know, see or think about, but then it comes back to us in ways we can't ignore as it washes up on the beach or um, finds its way into the food chain through microplastics or other things. And so there's this uh, sort of, um, uh, possibility for the humanities, I think, to engage with some of the psychological dimensions um, of uh, dealing with uh, this waste and waste production. Um, some of the some novels that currently deal with plastics, I think, in a good way. Um, one called *The Waste Tide* by Chen Shou Fan, uh, who's a Chinese science fiction writer, and he actually imagines uh, the this uh, Silicon Isle of plastic uh, off the coast of uh, China as the site for recycling. Um, but part of the, his motivation for doing this was to look at the human cost of who the recycle, the, the human and health cost to the recyclers themselves and who is processing the recycling. And so I think that some of the tension with China that you mentioned is uh, really important now for thinking, for considering the uh, health effects of uh, plastics. Um, in, even as we try to recycle them, and like how these affect other, uh, how these affect recyclers themselves, and what is the toxicity of actually trying to recycle some of this uh, material? So you mentioned uh, incineration and euphemisms for this in the uh, in, in you know the industry, uh, but I also wonder what accumulates after incineration. Um, so does it really just turn into ash to be sort of um, uh, then deposited elsewhere, or uh, where, what are the effects of consideration um, as a mitigation solution to um, some of the storage? Um, another novel that uh, also takes up plastics is A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki, and this one's sort of interesting. I teach in my contemporary uh, literature classes, uh, and this has to do with um, sort of uh, uh, Correspondence around the Pacific and um, also the uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch itself, and what washes uh, what washes ashore. Um, there's a, another film called um, Just Plastic Bag by Ron and Marani. This is a short film that takes the point of view of a plastic bag um, and imagines its existential crisis when it finds out that it cannot be uh, it cannot die. 
And so this raises this broader question, uh, you know, cultural question of um, what is uh, what is the value of ephemerality um, as opposed to duration? In is that different than what we're usually thinking, you know, usually thinking of? Um, the last one I'll make uh, has to do with the way you're talking about in-use uh, plastics. Um, so it struck me that um, the way you were talking about plastics in use um, and then um, when they're discarded as waste, it sounded a little bit like the language used to talk about carbon storage in a way, uh, so that when carbon's stored, we don't worry about them in the atmosphere. Um, so when plastics are used, you don't worry about them being in the dump. Uh, but it's only in the after, in like either the release of carbon or the, uh, the dumping of the plastics that these things are um, circulatable and become uh, a concern. And so I sort of wonder about um, how the language of carbon sequestration sort of parallels um, the way you're talking about um, plastics being, uh, being in use. Um, and so, let's see, uh, I guess one, one final point I'll make too. Um, I think it's significant you use the word fate uh, in your title, the fate of plastics. You know, in classical literature, there's deep concerns over how does one, can one change one's fate? Um, and so that's a very, very humanist term to bring into a conversation with uh, this material. Uh, and so maybe we might take that as also a further point to a uh, question from um, this, uh, the, the audience today. Should also acknowledge there are quite a few, there are quite a few environmental humanists in the room too. So I know there's a wealth of expertise just waiting to, uh, to ask the question. So I'll leave my uh, remarks at that.